uh, we good evening everyone we are here discussing a case of ards Uh, the case with it goes like a 38 year old male with the weight of 64 kg and height 5 feet 6 inches presented to our casualty with the complaints of fever and cough for past 3 days he was initially managed elsewhere as lrtia and he had progressively been worsening dyspnea which is now in a wh grade 4 he is referred here for the further management on baseline uh, findings in, on an examination he was tachycardic with the heart rate of 108 beats per minute tachycardic with the respiratory rate of 30 breaths per minute and febrile with a temperature of 101.3 degree fahrenheit he had bilateral extensive lung signs uh, he desaturated on room air with the saturation of 82% was using accessory muscles of respiration he had difficulty in speaking as well as lying down flat his gcs was 15 by 15 yeah just go back now just go back just go back Yes, sir. First slide. First slide. So this uh, gentleman is actually having a body weight of sixty-four kg. It's very important to take the height and the BMI in all patients. Height is important because if this patient is uh, heading towards ARDS, you know he has fever, cough, and dyspnea, then your uh, volume ventilation, the num, the amount of uh, milliliters per kg you will be giving will be decided by the Ideal body weight and the formula from the ARDS net is based on the height. You can calculate the ideal body weight from the height. And now in this patient with the fever, cough, and dyspnea, there is likely to be a pulmonary pathology, and there can be a extra pulmonary pathology also. So the extra pulmonary pathology can come from uh, you know there can be a extra pulmonary source of sepsis, and uh, you have the lung condition, the lung involvement because of sepsis. So the source is somewhere else. There can be a tropical infection here. and they can even be a viral myocarditis they can be fever because of the viral infection and the patient has gone into myocarditis lvf kind of a picture so these are uh, some of the differentials that uh, we would like to consider apart from this uh, you know pneumonia is obviously uh, the number one possibility but everything is not pneumonia uh, bacterial pneumonia or viral pneumonia it could be either fungal does not occur with such a short history and then there is a list of ards mimickers so those are the possibilities next slide and uh, patient uh, is actually uh, using accessory muscles and uh, the blood pressure i think is normal the blood pressure is normal dr prabhu yes sir it's 127 by uh, 84 okay so this is the situation the possibility number one is pneumonia but we have to keep our mind open to all other possibilities <laughs> pro bnp levels were acceptable his tropi were negative His echo was within normal limits. His lung USG show four to five B lines, and his raised examination was non-contributory. His COVID RT-PCR and H1N1 was sent, which came out to be negative afterward. So, just going there, Dr. Kishu, what is the uh, normal uh, uh, pro BNP levels in your lab, Dr. English? Six. So Yeah, Kishu, answer no issues. Uh, it's uh, up to five hundred picogram per ml. So pro BNP is elevated, right? So you know, less than four hundred rules. Anti pro BNP of less than four hundred rules of cardiac involvement. There is an elevation here, and it's a young patient. So I think the, the, some uh, myocardial dysfunction may be occurring, either because of the pneumonia. You know, there, there could be uh, some airway dysfunction, some kind of injury, or there could, could be even a. and pa pressure could be high putting strain on the right ventricle which is leading to a slightly elevated pro bnp this is not a normal uh, bnp acceptable one has to uh, see the echo properly and uh, apart from that the crp is elevated so the crp elevation actually uh, is seen not only in uh, infections or sepsis it can also be seen in inflammatory conditions and in sars conditions so crp could mean there's an infection or could there could be something else there could be an inflammatory state there could be an autoimmune disease so one has to think up all these possibilities and uh, your h1n1 is negative that is uh, very important along with covid and uh, you know covid uh, rt pcr is generally positive and even h1n1 but occasionally they can be negative so that is also to be considered one should not shut out the diagnosis okay carry on doctor vishnu so initial pf was 280 hmm. initial 
P.F. ratio. Yeah. Uh, so this was his day one in imaging, the X-ray and the CT scan. So if you look at this X-ray, Kushbu, uh, are there any air bronchograms? Uh, yes, sir, left side. Uh, Can you use the pointer and tell? Okay, pointer, sir. Pointer is on the left and bottom side. Okay, leave it. We can't test it. So I have the, 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 you see on the CT, there is a black line going uh, yes. very high region. Yes, yes, sir. The left side of the CT. So that is a uh, air bronchogram. And even if you see the X-ray on the right side, just above the diaphragm going vertically down, there is a black line. So when you get a black line or a translucent line in the background of opacity, white opacity, that is a air bronchogram. Generally, it means pneumonia, but can be seen in pulmonary edema and can be seen in pulmonary hemorrhage also. So it's important to identify these air bronchograms because they help you to diagnose the condition. Okay, Dr. Kushbu, carry on. So further in the course, the patient had worsening saturation on pulse oximetry and increased oxygen requirement. His in follow-up ABG, his PAF ratio decreased. His PAF was 62 on FIO2.8 and O2 saturation was 85%. His electrolytes were normal. He was still tachypneic, tachycardic with a respiratory rate of 40 and the heart rate being 118. He was in distress and started becoming irritable. At this point, we decided to put him on either an IV or HFNC or invasive ventilation. Uh, his culture... So last slide only, don't skip. Yes, sir. So culture is done. Uh, what culture did you send for the lungs? Did you send a lung culture or was a bar done or anything? So we sent paired blood culture. Ah. So blood culture was sent, right? Yes, sir. Along with that, we also send multiplex PCRs. On, from the sputum? From the sputum. Okay. So, uh, generally, uh, if possible, you know, once you try and do a ball, uh, if, but this, uh, here it might be difficult, ball uh, yield is 85% uh, to the tune of 85% in pneumonia if the patient has not received antibiotics in the last three days. However, if the patient has received antibiotics, the positivity goes down to 15%. So all uh, efforts should be made to actually get a microbiological diagnosis. And uh, the other thing is uh, the antibiotics. Uh, everybody has their own antibiotics and one has to look at the antibiogram of the uh, ICU. What kind of antibiogram uh, you are getting, what uh, organisms, what resistance. So I'm sure menopenem and ticoplanin were started on those basis. But generally, you know, uh, the thing is, uh, ticoplanin is uh, somewhat, I would reserve ticoplanin for specific situations where I suspect staph, because staph is not a common organism in community acquired pneumonia, and especially in our country. In the West, uh, they have more of staph, but in the, our ICUs, uh, we do not, at least in this part uh, where I practice, we do not get much staph. And uh, uh, the other thing is, uh, Dr. Nikolesh, uh, any reason why you didn't cover with azithromycin? Uh, nothing in particular, sir. I'll put it that way. This patient had also received levofloxacin, mm -hmm. actually empirically. And uh, what had happened was because of that, we had our own reservations whether we should cover him with atypical or not with an ongoing leukocytosis. Okay, okay. That is the only thing. Yeah, okay. So uh, the thing is, you know, uh, I would also like to add azithromycin to cover for legionella and mycoplasma. You know, the commonest organisms causing community acquired pneumonia, if this is a pneumonia, we are not sure. It would be pneumococcus, that is step pneumonia, and H influenza, mycoplasma. So these are the common organisms uh, which cause uh, community acquired pneumonia, especially in this patient who has no risk factors. And I would reserve ticoplanin. So my go to antibiotic here would be meropenem uh, and uh, your uh, azithromycin. Actually, this is the reason a multiplex PCR is done. But the only thing is, there was no clue actually in terms of yeah, yeah. what it yeah, 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 sure. grows. Yeah. So the other uh, thing is, uh, uh, Dr. Nikolesh, any other uh, investigations? Uh, I mean, did you try to rule out uh, vasculitis, like a urine examination looking at an active sediment or you know, any drop in hemoglobin for alveolar hemorrhage? So I believe... No, sir, nothing else, nothing else. Actually, rest everything was non-contributory. We decided to pick up only the positive points here. And uh, rest everything was non-contributory. Like this guy suddenly came upon us and... Uh, 
we had a problem in that sense that uh, there was no uh, etiology uh, clear cut or straightforward that we can make out so the first suspicion was viral only but when it comes to viral if your multiplex pcr is negative if your h1n1 and your uh, covid rt pcr is negative uh, you just, we just don't know what else to look for yes so that is only, yes that is the point i'm trying to drive here that uh, the differential diagnosis one would like to look at the urine any rbc wbcs are there pointed towards vasculitis or something like good pastures and uh, also do a good systemic examination ultrasound etc to pick up any focus of infection which may have spread to lungs and what is happening in the lungs is actually uh, so ultrasound ultrasound abdomen was done it was non contributory actually yes yes so i i'm just elaborating the points i'm sure that you already said that so these are some of the things that one would like to See as a differential. Okay, Doctor Kushum, carry on. It was started on the maintenance IV fluid at the 30 ml per hour. It was considered as a case of bad and worsening ARDS, probably secondary to bacterial pneumonia. Yes, just go this back. This, uh, this, so, what is the last slide? Now, after this. So, this one? Yeah, yeah this is the next slide. Okay. Carry on. So, this dyspnea worsened and we continued to desaturate on oxygen flow of 15 liter per minute. Follow up ABG were suggestive of PaO2 of 50 with oxygen saturation 86%. His pH was 7.32 and he was on NRVM 15 liter, where double oxygen source being contemplated. In the further course was discussed and he was initiated on HFNC with a flow rate of 25 liters initially with the FiO2 70%, which were subsequently increased to 40 liters with the FiO to 85% owing to the desaturation. On this setting, his oxygen saturation improved to 92%. Along with this, he was started on the DVT prophylaxis with enoxaparin 0.4 ml as subcutaneous on daily basis. And a conscious proning were initiated in the hope of improving lung oxygenation. Okay, so Dr. Mayank, uh, what kind of recommendations are there for you know, treating ARDS? Obviously this patient has ARDS, he's initially uh, I don't know what is the PF here, but he had to a PF of 280 to start with. So it is in mild ARDS. What kind of recommendations uh, are there to treat uh, this patient now? Dr. Ma'am, we are muted, I think, or? So the first important thing that we have to consider in this patient is that at this present moment, can we start him up on a non-invasive ventilatory support? If it is possible for us to non-invasive ventilatory support, then we can add, <clears throat> depending upon the pH, depending upon this, we can set up a small amount of uh, pH that is there. Secondly, it is the patient has to go with a steroid therapy. Thirdly, a higher end antibiotic. Fourthly, we have to set up the a small criteria is there for diagnosing ARDS, that is a so, body so, criteria. No, no. My, my question, Dr. Mayank, is what kind of respiratory support is advised here now? The patient obviously is in ARDS, so what kind of respiratory support? What is the PF here, Dr. Kushbu? Sir, uh, the saturation 92 and the FiO2 85, that is around uh, 110. No, no, so that is not, which is a PO2 is 50. Sorry, PO, uh, I'm so sorry, the PO2 is around 50, so it's less, uh, and I if think I we should go ahead with an invasive ventilatory support to this yeah, patient. So you see, if the patient is in ARDS, the recommendations are to start uh, high flow nasal cannula. High flow nasal cannula is recommended over NIV right? and any kind of uh, face, uh, face mask or uh, non reusable nasal mask. So you start with high flow nasal cannula once the patient is in ARDS. And uh, if you do not have ARDS, uh, sorry, with the high flow nasal cannula, if you do not have high flow nasal cannula, then you go ahead with NIV. But NIV cannot be used if the PF is less than 150. It is increased mortality, very well documented. And 150 to 200 is a gray zone for NIV. So the recommendations are high flow nasal cannula preferably. If you do not have high flow nasal cannula, then uh, NIV as per... It is a ventilatory support. Yes. So please carry on. Sir, on the next day, his uh, chest X-ray wasn't. So and this X-ray is of a very poor quality. You know, you can hardly see any lungs. The diaphragms are up. So everything has become... You cannot comment anything on this X-ray. So carry on, Dr. Kushu. And he, he was started on IV solumidrol at 60 mg per day. Uh, he was given a regular diuretic, uh, last 20 mg BD, 
His follow up echo was normal, and his lung USG showed seven to eight B lines. His RT feet were initiated as he was desaturating on uh, on minimal exertion, and his IV fluid was KVP only twenty ml per hour. So, Doctor Khushbu, uh, you should give more fluids or uh, normal fluids or less fluids in these patients of ARDS. Sir, uh, we need to rule out uh, whether there is volume depletion or any shock. If there is uh, no shock. Or no volume requirement, we should uh, adapt a uh, restrictive fluid strategy in this patient. We should not overload patient with fluids. Yes, yeah, so we have to do a restrictive fluid strategy, and uh, this was based on the FACT trial. The name of the trial is FACT trial FCCT, which recommended restrictive fluid strategy in patients with ARDS. And even if the patient is uh, developing hypotension, it is better to use early vasopressors than rather to load him with fluids. That is another. and some trials are going on to give evidence one is a clover trial which is going on to see the fluid requirement versus vasopressors uh, which is better early vasopressors or loading with fluid in patients of ARDS with hypotension dr masan you were talking about steroids so what is the evidence right. what is the evidence say for the use of methyl prednisone yes. Yeah, it is. It is. It is recommended that it is a leukoproliferative phase that is evident in the seven to fourteen days of the period of AIDS. At this particular point of time, we should add a steroid early, like methyl prednisone, one milligram per kg of body weight, which is recommended over a period of twenty-one days. Even dexamethasone, twenty milligram IV is also a recommendation. Okay. So steroid actually, uh, I would like to differ a little. The evidence is either plus minus. Some ICUs use it. Some ICUs do not use it, and that is the the uh, evidence also it is not conclusive so may you may use methyl prednisolone and uh, when you use methyl prednisolone the studies have shown that uh, there is hyponatremia there is increased uh, blood sugar and you know increased blood sugar increases neuromuscular weakness but there is no increased incidence of infections so that is very important and uh, you use it as 1 mg per kg body weight in the first 7 days if you are using and after that if you are using you use 2 mg per kg And uh, you don't have to taper it as such. You can stop it abruptly if required. So that is the methyl prednisolone. And dexamethasone is actually more for COVID rather than for classic ARDS. So the, those are the trials and the evidence for use of steroids in ARDS. So actually, you... sir, there is so much data and so many trials of steroids in uh, ARDS that if we try to assimilate everything. probably all forms of steroids would be applicable all forms of doses would be applicable at different points in time but most of them have probably some sort of a consensus that they would prefer it if it is given within the initial two weeks yes absolutely that is what the recommendation is to we have to give it in the first one to two weeks after that does not help that is absolutely right right sir because it is the leukoproliferative phase of ARDS it is helpful only in that phase that is why the data is evident about it Yes, but it is also documented that interleukin levels in bowel do decrease, and many studies have shown that the ventilator days do reduce. But again, like we have just all discussed, the data is inconclusive, and that is the recommendation by the surviving sepsis guidelines published recently. The last surviving sepsis guidelines is the data is inconclusive. You can use it, you may not use it. Carry on, Doctor Kushbu. The patient continued to worsen and desaturated. With increase in tachypnea, tachycardia, this PA ratio started worsening. His SpO2 saturation was 80 to 82 percent on 50 liter of HFNC with FiO2 one. Worsening chest X-ray and EBG was documented. PO2 45 with 50 liter of HFNC, FiO2 one, and O2 sats 80 percent. At this point, we decided to proceed with invasive ventilatory support. The same was briefed to the relative, and with prior informed consent, he was intubated and taken on invasive ventilator support. So, Doctor Bhishma, patient is deteriorating now on your high flow nasal cannula, right? Yes. Yes. So, so, when do you decide to intubate a patient on high flow nasal cannula? You know, what parameters do you see, or do you see some index or something? Yes, sir. Uh, in case we are using HFNC, there is a bedside tool called as ROX index, which consists of uh, SpO two divided by FiO two, and this ratio is further divided by RR. It's been said if this ratio is uh, more than 4.8, then the likely failure of HFNC, HF, uh, failure of HFNC is very very less likely. But simultaneously, if this indices indi indi at the end of two hour and twelve hour is less than 2.8 and 3.8 respectively, 
then there is high likelihood that HF, the patient on HFNC will worsen and will require eventually invasive ventilation. Yes, so you see the ROX index rightly said, use the ROX index, which is the bedside tool, is PF divided by RR, and you're supposed to see it at two hours, six hours, and 12 hours. It is a more continuous monitoring tool, and like she has given the numbers, numbers are laid down. So if the number is you know, decreasing, that means the patient is worsening, and then you have to decide to intubate, or you, if the number is so and so between a certain value, then you have to increase the support. So there are guidelines laid down with ROX index. So depending on the ROX index, you proceed, uh, and the ROX index should be evaluated at two hours, six hours, 12 hours. So intubation can be based on ROX index. The other thing is you can look at the patient just clinically. If the patient is uh, you know, deteriorating, if the respiratory rate is going beyond 35, if there is hypotension, if he is getting obtunded, if the SATs are not being maintained despite full support from the high flow nasal cannula, then again, you have to intubate the patient. So that is how one decides about intubating on high flow nasal cannula. Uh, so uh, apart from that, uh, Dr. Nikhil, sir, you like to tell us, you know, how this works, high flow nasal cannula. Uh, so basically, uh, speaking, whenever we talk about a high flow nasal cannula, it has its own separate flow meter that comes with the machine. It has a kit. Uh, it uses humidification by the uh, water that is provided with it. And uh, then what do we do is we set the flow on the machine and the FiO2. Now the flow and the FiO2 are the variables that can be set. And the biggest advantage in this is, um, actually I won't say 100%, majority of the times the alarm goes off if uh, your FiO2 levels, if you're setting it or trying to set beyond 95%. But it's like an interplay of how much uh, flow you want to give. You can go up to 60 liters of flow in terms of uh, giving supplemental oxygen, which is not feasible by any other uh, device as such with such a high FiO2. So that way it has come into vogue in terms of using it in respiratory failure, especially hypoxic respiratory failure. It initially also came across as a tool to facilitate weaning. But more than that, during COVID times, it has become very popular in terms of its use in ARDS for a pure hypoxic respiratory failure. So, so uh, you like to talk about the mechanism? So Dr. Masan, you want to talk about the mechanism, how it acts at the physiology level, hypronasal cannula? Dr. Masan? it delivers the greater amount of oxygen part at the FRC part and that's how it maintains the saturation oxygen of the patient. Yes, so you know to discuss the physiology of high flow nasal cannula, first of all you know it delivers warm humidified air. Uh, it delivers uh, warm and humidified air. So because of this you know secretions don't become tenacious, patient is able to cough out and warm air leads to bronchodilatation, so there is decreased resistance. Then the patient is more comfortable because you know it's uh, not something which causes claustrophobia, unlike uh, NIV mask. Then very importantly, it leads to washout of the nasopharyngeal space, dead air in the nasopharyngeal space. So when this dead space is washed out, it leads to an increase in alveolar ventilation, right? So all these factors uh, are very important in, in causing a uh, comfort level to the patient and improving compliance and improving oxygen. Apart from so compliance, also so basically it will create something like a positive pressure environment. Yes, which can the, actually because of the CO 2s because the high flow uh, of the uh, high flow of the nasal cannula. Once you start increasing the flow rate, the, there is a peep element set in at the nasal level, which extends to the lungs. So the flow, the peep that you get is because of the high flow rates. And the maximum peep you get is only <laughs> to eight with a flow rate of 60 liters per minute. So it gives an element of peep. All these factors the lead to improved compliance, decreased work of breathing, and decreased respiratory drive. Because you see the respiratory drive is very important. One has to decrease the respiratory drive. These patients who are in respiratory failure have a very high respiratory drive, which and they're generating high lung volumes, high respiratory rate, leading to large swings in the fluid pressure and transpulmonary pressure which is leading to lung injury. And once the respiratory drive comes down, your tidal volume comes down, the rate comes down, and the lung injury reduces, and it gives time for your antibiotics or a primary therapy to work. So that is the main uh, uh, physiology of high flow nasal cannula. Anything anybody wants to add, please add. Dr. Mitlesh, you were saying something. 
Yes, sir. Uh, one more thing was that basically nothing like same thing. I said that it, it can create a positive pressure like environment which exerts a uh, CO2 also. And uh, plus, because of the humidification, it makes your work of breathing very easier, improves your mucopressillary clearance. And because patient, uh, you know, they feel patients feel very claustrophobic with a BiPAP machine or an NIV. And uh, with uh, HFNC, the sort of comfort levels that they get are slightly better. Having said that, the sort of, uh, you know, what should I say, uh, from whatever we have experienced, from our experiences, sometimes because of the heated flow, certain patients feel very uncomfortable with that air going into their nose. And they keep on getting watering in the eyes, as well as uh, certain times nasal congestion because of that. Right. So, and if uh, there is... Uh, if so there is uh, yes, sir. So, Dr. what... Uh, which study led to the evolution of high flow nasal cannula? There's a famous study after yes, which... sir. the Florali trial, which yes, uh, it has, it compared the three things: the oxygen, uh, the conventional oxygen, the NIV, and the compared compared the primary uh, outcome into mortality as well as the uh, rate of intubation after using these three. So in so HFNC group, the, what is the main outcome? So rate of intubation uh, after using this and the uh, mod, it has a more the rate of intubation was less with the HFNC group as against the NIV and conventional oxygen group. And 28 and 90 days mortality was lesser in HFNC group. Yes, so if HFNC was superior to NIV in all respects, and especially with a PF of less than 200, well, high flow nasal cannula fared pretty well, and it is recommended to be used for a PF less than 150 by what 200 because of this florality study findings and subsequent small studies which have been done. You cannot use NIV if your PF is less than 150 to 200. So that is another thing which we got out of this florality study. Absolutely right. Carry on, protocol. And, and one more thing, you know, florality trial actually started out looking at intubation rates. It's very funny. But what they found at the end of it, it's probably the intubation rates did not matter that much. But definitely, uh, you know, most of the critical care trials suffer from the bugbears of mortality benefits. So mortality benefits were much better when patients were used uh, HFNC as compared to the other two interventions. Okay, Dr. Carry on, Dr. Gushbu. Okay, sir. So as we put the patient on invasive mechanical ventilation, our initial setting was volume control mode with a tidal volume of 400, PEEP of 8, FiO2 of 100%, with a respiratory rate of 15. We tried to maintain a PEEP lag of around 30 to 35 centimeters of water. Two hours later, his O2 saturations were 75%. On, on ABG, the PO2 was 50. The PEEP was then increased to 12 and later on 15 in the hope of improving oxygenation, but in vain, the SPO2 remained around 75 to 78%. And after four hours of ventilation, we decided to prone him and he was sedated paralyzed for the same. So, a proning, Dr. Yes. Uh, you have started proning here. Now the question to you is, which is the preferred mode for uh, this thing? Any preferred mode is there for uh, ARDS? Sir, uh, with the volume control mode, we can uh, set the tidal volume and we can achieve a, a low tidal volume ventilation. With no, that is all correct. right. You can achieve a low tidal volume with pressure control. Is there any preferred mode, uh, PCB or VCV is preferred or is it either? Sir, it is either. Okay. So that is correct. You can use either PCV or uh, VCV for the outcome is the same. PCV does have some benefits in ventilating these patients, but it does not translate into uh, meaningful outcomes. Now, uh, you have set the PEEP. How do you set PEEP in a patient of ARDS? This is a very practical question, a very important question. How do you set the PEEP in a patient of ARDS? So how do you actually do it? You must be setting the PEEP in ARDS patients. Yes, sir. Um, after initial tidal volume, we set a PEEP uh, around six to eight, depending on our oxygen saturation. And we try to maintain a PEEP light of around 30. We then gradually increase the PEEP and see its response on saturation as well as PEEP light. If the PEEP light remains in the range of 27 to 30, then we'll go increasing PEEP gradually one hour. And we look at the saturation and we repeat the ABG after four hours. So that is one of the thing we are doing routinely. Okay, so there is a incremental increase of PEEP. So yes, uh, any other way you can uh, set the PEEP? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, we can uh, either uh, uh, use, can use the 
Any tables? Any tables you can use? Yes, sir. According to our this network, they have already yes. defined the yes. fixed, fixed so, uh, PIP and FIO two tables. So yes. that we can use eitherly, or we can use the driving pressure alternatively. If the driver pressure is maintained around the fifteen centimeter of water, less than or equal to, then we can increment PIP up to that mark. Very good. That's very good. So you can use the uh, ARDS network uh, table, or you can use uh, your uh, Driving pressure, but generally one first tries to use plateau pressure. Well, it is up to you uh, how the and the patient what the patient is offering to you. So the incremental PEEP strategy is one which is actually very nice and most useful. Uh, you increase the PEEP uh, uh, small increments of two and wait for some time and look at the uh, compliance, or you can use the PEEP plateau also. So if the compliance goes on improving, you keep increasing the PEEP. Uh, and you look at the plateau pressure also. The plateau pressure won't increase if the compliance is improving, but you need to reach a stage where the compliance will start uh, worsening. So that is the end point of uh, titrating the PEEP. The other thing is uh, when you increase uh, the PEEP, you know, the compliance will go on improving, but a stage will come when the compliance will. But here your oxygenation can go on improving. So sometimes there may be a trade off between a Worsening compliance and improving oxygenation. If oxygenation is not good, you may have to settle for that also. The other thing is, you know, the aim of uh, ventilation is to deliver oxygen through the tissues. So when we increase the pressures on the ventilator, you know, one effect it has is that it the pleural pressure increases, so it compresses the right atrium, and the venous return decreases, thereby the cardiac output decreases. So even if you are getting a higher oxygenation. If your cardiac output is decreasing, the delivery of oxygen to the peripheral tissues will decrease. One must be aware of this. And how will you make out your cardiac output is decreasing? So we are not putting you know cardiac output monitors all the time in these patients. So you can look at the saturation gap. You have a uh, arterial saturation and you have venous saturation. So if the difference between the arterial and the venous saturation is increasing, then you know that the uh, cardiac output is decreasing. So it's very important to keep an eye on the cardiac output also, especially in bad lungs where the pressures are high. So that is about uh, uh, you know setting the PEEP and how to uh, understand the mechanics. So the ARDS net uh, table also can be used. It's very simple. Generally, at a FIO2 of 60, one would like to set a PEEP of 8 uh, and uh, tidal volume of 6 ml per kg and uh, keep the plateau pressure less than 30. So the, those are the goals and the uh, ways to go about it. Okay, Dr. Kushmu, carry on. So the proning mechanism was initiated and he was prone for a duration of 14 hours, followed by 16 hours on the next day. His follow-up ABG improved and he went on to reach O2 sats around 85% with PO2 of around 52 to 56. With a marginal decompensation in terms of pH, namely 7.26 and PCA to 50. So, uh, okay. just go back one second. Yeah, last slide only. Next slide. You, so yes. you have medazolam here. So Kushbu, is medazolam the ideal uh, sedation for the, these patients? Uh, so we uh, gave him aliquots of fentanyl also. Fentanyl so that was, so that is that and sedation. But uh, so pain relief is very important. You have to provide analgesia. Analgesia comes before sedation. So fentanyl should be there. But why is medazolam? Um, Sorry to interrupt. Yes. Can dexpitomiridine can be a good option because dexpitomiridine fulfills the purpose of analgesia as well as that of sedation. So, definitely, it is a definitely. so you see the problem. We have medazolam. to monitor the cardiac output of the patient because cardiac output is dependent upon the heart rate. So, with the dexpitomiridine, the problem will be of the heart rate. The better combination would be to have a combination of a sedative agent along with an opioid. Along with a short acting muscle relaxant, that muscle relaxant can be metabolized by the blood, like by Hoffman elimination. So it is a better choice. So you see, for sedation, uh, medazolam is not recommended. Rest of the drugs, like you said, dexamethasone or propofol, along with some fentanyl, can be used. The problem with medazolam, why medazolam is not recommended uh, and is out practically, is because it leads to a high incidence. Mm -hmm intensive care syndrome and prolonged ventilation. So because of these two reasons, medazolam has been uh, downgraded and you would either use uh, dexmetomidine like he has said, and uh, you can use propofol along with fentanyl also. 
with dexmedomaldine, you may have to use some fentanyl because it's not such a strong analgesic. So those are the recommendations. Medazolam has been downgraded because it leads to increased ventilation days and there's an increased in incidence of post-intensive care syndrome. So what is this post-intensive care syndrome? So this post-intensive care syndrome is that when the patients are discharged, they have you know neurological manifestations. They have persisting cognitive defects. So that is the reason why medazolam should not be used. As of now, the two clear-cut indications to use medazolam in the ICU is one alcohol withdrawal syndrome, and second is status epilepticus, which is refractory. So medazolam should be avoided. Uh, so but it is also known to cause uh, increased incidence of delirium in ICU, being a benzodiazepine group, and which is also an independent predictor of mortality in ICU. So yes, ideally, it should not be used. Yes, correct. Uh, just one question. I mean, uh, dexamethasone. We've used it practically, but somehow it doesn't tend to, you know, what should I say, take patient in such deeper planes of sedation that we are we become comfortable with a patient getting ventilated on a uh, in terms of ARDS. So that's so, where the problem happens. You so, need a slightly deeper plane. So you have ARDS to combine patient. it with fentanyl. You need to combine it with fentanyl. The study was done comparing propofol to dexmethasone in ARDS patients. And uh, they found no difference, and fentanyl was also used in that uh, as required. So you are right, dexmedrotine does not cause deep sedation. If you use too high a dose, it leads to bradycardia. So I agree with that. So Profol is a good alternative here along with fentanyl. Fentanyl has to be used. Some degree of fentanyl generally has to be used. So carry on. Professor. Further on day four, his ABG showed PO2 of 60, PCO2 of 46, and a pH of 7.3. At the peep of 10, his auto saturation improved to 90%. His peep lines were maintained to 30 to 35. His sedation and paralysis were continued. The proning cycles continued for uh, five more days with the four, sorry, the proning cycles continued for up to 14 to 16 hours. His CX, chest x ray improved further and his tachycardia also improved. He started tolerating fits. He had no new organ dysfunction and his cultures were negative. So, the escalation of antibiotic to Piptas was done. So, now, Dr. Nicholas, just uh, from the management point of view, before you know, prone did you try any recruitment maneuvers or driving pressure, uh, whether he was uh, you know, responding to any recruitment maneuvers or you know, that? Sir, I do not, I used to do recruitment maneuvers when I did my fellowship. We've stopped doing it now because uh, COVID times we've seen certain times recruitment maneuvers. To take them to high peep and uh, certain of them blew their blew you know developed uh, pneumos and uh, went into problems. Okay, so you do not do recruitment maneuvers, but that is specific to COVID, you know. But this is not your COVID is negative here, and for non yes. recruitment maneuvers can be tried. So it's an individual decision. Like you have not done it, that's okay. What about driving pressure? You were not able to get anything with the driving pressures. Uh, we haven't used it as a routine, sir. I have uh, studied about it as a concept. But again, there's no standardization. So I'm not sure about uh, bedside application in terms of using a driving pressure strategy for managing a patient of ventilated ARDS. Um, how good or useful will that be? I'll be that fact. Well, it depends on the lungs and uh, what kind of uh, pressures you are getting. It can be tried, you know. Initially, you can try the conventional ventilation, but driving pressure is a strategy. You try it uh, sometimes, uh, you might find it useful. And uh, the, uh, the thing is about recruitment maneuvers also can be tried. They help sometimes. Now, the question is, in which patients uh, clinically, if you were to judge, would recruitment maneuvers help? If you were to see the patient and then think, well, I, this patient might get recruited. Uh, so what are the factors or clinical parameters which help you to decide? Dr. Kushbu, can you answer that or is that a question? Uh, sir, in the uh, patient who are not responding are having severe hypoxemia and who are not uh, responding to the low tidal ventilation. Uh, in that patient, we can try recruitment. No, that is true, but which which patient? All patients are not recruitable. You know, you do a recruitment maneuver, it doesn't improve in some patients. In some patients, it improves. So, what factors help you decide clinically whether this patient's lungs is recruitable or not? Doctor Masan? probably sir, stress is the index. No, no, Doctor Masan? Sir, there is a criteria. These are these are called the recruitable lungs and the non-recruitable lungs. Actually, we see the driving pressure difference and the P plat difference of the patient, and then we judge whether this patient can be uh, can can have a recruitable lung or a non-recruitable lung, depending upon the tidal volume as well as the P that is required for the patient. 
Well, okay. uh, have... the, 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 you know, to be more specific, there are three, four factors. If the lung is having severe ARDS, it is likely to be more recruitable. The answer, the explanation for that is uh, when you recruit, you are going to recruit collapsed alveoli. And severe ARDS has a more uh, element of collapsed alveoli. That is the proportion of collapsed alveoli is much more in severe RDS. So recruitability will be more in severe RDS. Then if the lung is in the early stage, it is more recruitable because later on it starts going into a fibro, fibrotic, fibroproliferative stage. Third, the lung should have bilateral disease, symmetrical, by and large, because if it is asymmetric, then your pressures will be transmitted differentially to uh, two lungs and you may end up with barotrauma. And fourth is extra pulmonary ARDS. Extra pulmonary ARDS causing a septic lung is more recruitable than a pulmonary ARDS. So these are the clinical features which help you to decide and you know have a pointer whether that lung is recruitable or not. So that is about recruitability. And uh, well, having a recruitment man yeah. So having a recruitment maneuver also means that you are creating different type of zones because as rightly pointed out, you said that it has to be a homogeneous pathology. Most of the times the pathologies that we see are non-homogeneous. And that's where the problem comes that when you use a recruitment maneuver, there's a possibility that you may push that patient into Willi as well, a ventilator-induced lung injury. And you have, to is... it, you have to do it carefully and uh, you know you have to volume load the patient also. You should not be in hypotension. But by and large, you know, you, you can try it if you are careful. It helps sometimes. Sir, but applying, uh, like Dr. Rikhresh has sir, said, just now that applying recruitable maneuvers can lead to volume trauma and barotrauma in these patients, which is ventilator induced lung injury. So, uh, what, like in every patient, as you said, these are the four criteria. Bilateral is one of the criteria. Does really extra pulmonary uh, issues they respond well to these recruitable maneuvers? Yes, the answer, the physiology is that, you know, why extra pulmonary is better than pulmonary? Because in pulmonary, you have mainly consolidation. Pulmonary would be something like a pneumonia. Okay, so these right. have a lot of sticky atelectasis. While, you in, uh, while sorry, uh, I'll just repeat that. In pulmonary ARDS, you know, you get a lot of consolidation and the alveoli are different, are difficult to open up. While in uh, ARDS, you know, it's cytokine mediated injury and the alveoli are more amenable to be opened up. So that is the difference why extra pulmonary ARDS is more amenable to opening up rather than pulmonary ARDS. Pulmonary oh. ARDS essentially means pneumonia because the, the difference in pulmonary ARDS, we get primarily consolidation, while in extra pulmonary ARDS, it's mainly cytokine mediated injury. Cytokine basis, right. Yes. Carry on, Dr. Kushmi. So on day five, his ABG showed PO2 of 70, his CO2 45, his pH was 7.32 and his O2 saturation improved to 94% on FiO2 of 0.5. During the day, paralytic agent were withdrawn. The PEEP was brought down to the 8 and physiotherapy was initiated. His hemodynamics remained stable. He tolerated feed well and there were no new organ dysfunction. So, Dr. Kushbu, uh, coming to proning again. Now, question for you is, if the oxygenation does not improve on proning, will you stop proning? Uh, no, sir. I'll continue it for at least a period of time, four days or five days. So, Which what benefit are you getting if the oxygenation is not improving? So, uh, it may take some time, but gradually it will start uh, operating as the dorsal part gets no, more no. ventilated. Let's leave the mechanism. Mechanism is okay. The, mm -hmm. the, the, but the saturation is not improving. You have prone twice, 16 hour ses sessions have been done. Uh, will you continue proning, considering that proning can have side effects and uh, they can, it can be risky? Yes, sir. In that case, I would like to uh, discontinue the proning and I would look so, for... So, Dr. Krishpu, the answer here is, you know, the, so, sorry to ask for little difficult questions. This is... No, sir, it's okay. Is no, it's, that, it's okay. Yeah, Dr. Masan, you want to answer? Should we stop proning if the saturation... No, is? sir. No, sir. No, sir. Please, please carry on. Please carry on. So, so what is your take on this, Dr. Masan? Saturation is not improving. You have done two sessions. No, sir. I'll stop proning. I'll stop proning. Definitely. Okay. So the answer here is that we should not stop proning. If the saturation is not improving but not worsening also, you should not stop proning because proning improves the compliance and decreases ventilator lung injury. Your saturation may not be improving, but your ventilator-induced lung injury does improve. 
more of a benefit is obtained from the reduced ventilator induced lung injury rather than oxygenation in patients with proning. So that is very important to realize. The criteria laid down to stop proning is if the PF falls by 20%. If on proning the PF is falling by 20%, then you have to stop proning. So this is very important to realize. And uh, the other thing is uh, the use of neuromuscular blockers. So the patient here was on neuromuscular blockers. So Dr. Khushbu, what is the current uh, recommendation for use of neuromuscular blockers in ARDS? Should we use continuous for 24 to 48 hours or should we use restrictedly? How, how should we use uh, neuromuscular blockers? So we, took, we should restrict the use for uh, early, uh, early period of the ventilation when we need to achieve a ventilator synchronization, probably 48 hours. And uh, we should then look for tapering, uh, stopping the neuromuscular blockage. No, should we use continuous or should we use as required? As, sir, initially continuous we should use for at least 48 hours. And no, then is, does that help? If you use continuous infusion, is it better than intermittent? Uh, it, it avoids ventilatory desynchrony actually. So it is always better to keep the patient paralyzed when the patient is having proning as well as. So that that actually pre prevents the ventilator desynchrony. That that is right. It prevents the ventilator synchrony, but you have sedation also. So the question here is, you have you have sedated the patient. That is going to improve the synchrony, and you have the option of either using continuous neuromuscular blockers or intermittent policies if it's going into synchrony. So which one will you go for? So for initial 48 hours, at least continuous. No, that is not correct. That is the point I'm trying to drive. That was the concept, and uh, there is a misconcept now. So that, uh, there are two trials which have been done on pro, uh, neuromuscular blockers. Can you name the trials, Dr. Kushbu? The one is Acuris. Yeah, that was in 2010, which is the latest which has changed the guidelines. Mm, so I so there is a Rose trial, which was done Rose, in 2018. Huh? So now the consensus is that you should use it as and when required. Give okay. There is no problem with sedation. And if you are not able to manage the boluses, and if the these are very frequent, then you use a continuous infusion for as short a time as possible. What are the recommendations for neuromuscular blockers? Huh? As per the evidence. So the two trials, accuracies in 2010 and Roche trial in 2018. So based on this, we have these recommendations now. And this is from surviving sepsis guidelines. Okay, you must read what is the surviving sepsis guidelines uh, recommendation uh, for uh, ARDS. So they have come up with new recommendations. And what is the PF recommended now for proning the patient as per surviving sepsis guidelines? After a meta-analysis of all proning trials, is it 150 or is it something else? Anyone? You, you, you're supposed to prone at a PF of 200. This is the surviving sepsis guidelines recommendation after a meta-analysis of all the proning trials. Huh? Okay. Carry on. So his ABG showed con consistent improvement with PO2 80, the CO2 42 at the PEEP 56 and pulse ox saturation 95% on the FIO2.4. His mild sedation was continued, his CXR was better. And during the day, sedation was brought to a minimal, he was given a CPAP trial with a view of winning and extubation. On follow up, he was extubated the next day post SBT and taken on supplemental oxygen. The next day with stable oxygen saturation on four liter per minute. Physiotherapy was initiated and actively and he was shifted out of ICU on day eight. So now Dr. Khushbu, this patient has recovered within seven days uh, in the ICU, right? Yes, sir. And for three days he was outside. Now he, you have started him on uh, medicine and uh, this thing, uh, uh, ticoplanin. And you have de-escalated also after three days or four days of meropenem? So day four, we de-escalated. Day four, sir. Day four. Okay. So, Dr. Kushbu, would you think it is safe to de-escalate in the absence of any cultures? Or Dr. Masan, do you want to answer that? Should we de-escalate in the absence of cultures? No, sir. It is not safe. It is not safe to de-escalate. Yes. So, you know... De escalation without cultures becomes very risky. Supposing he was resistant to peptides, and we are not even sure whether he has a bacterial pneumonia because he has responded very fast and you have given one antibiotic meropenem for three days. And 
uh, after I prepare this entire bacterium, I do not know what the antibiogram your hospital is. Maybe it works, maybe it does not, but in my ICU, it will not work. So, three days so of. Actually, all cultures were negative for him. So, that so, is why we didn't have a lead at all in terms of uh, microbiology. So, then the, the diagnosis is a viral pneumonia here. Does, do we have a viral pneumonia here or do we have an ARDS mimicker here? Is, are we dealing with a bacterial pneumonia? Looks like looks like a viral pneumonia only because the way it has responded, then probably steroids would have worked. But the only thing was that uh, we did a I told you we did a multiplex PCR and a screen as well for virus, and that was also negative. So we were at a which end exactly what we were treating. So you see now, Dr. Nikolesh, uh, to discuss it, you know, methyl prednisone dose 16 mg per kg would probably not treat uh, the ARDS mimickers. You know, normally you have to give higher dose of steroids. And if it was a viral pneumonia, we do not know how to treat viral pneumonias other than uh, H1N1 primarily, and their steroids are contraindicated, they lead to worsening. So it generally would worsen if you were giving steroids. We do not have H1N1 N1 positive. We do not have sufficient evidence to suggest it's a bacterial pneumonia. So my take is that this is a viral pneumonia, which is not COVID, which is not swine flu, which is something else, which is not picked up by PCR. There are many viruses, and even these PCR multiplex, I do not know which one you have done. They do not cover all the viruses. And PCR is not the holy grail in uh, diagnosing uh, viruses or bacteria. It can be uh, negative also, even if the virus is there or the bacteria is there. Sometimes they can be false negative. It depends a lot on the technique, etc. So I think this was a viral pneumonia self-limiting. Many viral pneumonias are self-limiting. Even uh, H1N1 is self-limiting, for example. You may not give anything. You just ventilate the patient, support it, use good lung protective strategies and the patient can come out. So I think Dr. Niklesh, do you think this also this was a viral pneumonia which is probably not picked up on your PCR? Most likely it, like, it seems to be that because the way he has improved one, secondly, uh, no trace or no uh, other things on uh, cultures that we could make out. No other new organ dysfunctions, uh, very bad bacterial sepsis. I would assume that if uh, the course would be more florid and the course would be much more tougher, single organ dysfunction um, like uh, this and uh, recovering so fast, most likely it's viral only. To say that yeah. whether steroid worked or not, very early, very difficult yeah. to say. Yeah, you have given that prednisone 60 mg per kg, so it may have worked if it was an ARDS mimicker, for example, acute isnophilic pneumonia. So acute isnophilic pneumonia, uh, hypersensitivity pneumonitis, all these ARDS mimickers. So I think this was a viral pneumonia, but, but very difficult yeah, to say. Because, of the, because the way he was unstable initially, we couldn't plan a bronchoscopy there. Yeah, yeah, and that is the case. No, so no, that no. would have given us some definitive answers, maybe. Maybe, that too I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah. Look, looking in uh, hindsight, maybe bowel could have been done once he was on the ventilator with lower settings, you know, so just to give a, get a diagnosis because the diagnosis is not clear. But the patient was also improving, so you know. The, so one, these decisions. Yeah, sometimes the uh, patient starts improving, so yeah. you start wondering whether yes. uh, you should start, yeah. uh, whether you should even think of doing some new yes. intervention. Yes, I agree. I, I agree. Patient, patient was improving. Agreed. Carry on, Doctor Kushbu. So now the next slides are regarding the point of discussion. Uh, in the case scenario, do we need to stick Berlin criteria in terms of labeling this as a ARDS? or we use it being fully aware of fallacies, which can lead to confounding differentials. So confounding differentials means what, Dr. Kushbu? What, what, what do you mean by What do you mean by ARDS? You know, ARDS is a list of causes, and then there are ARDS mimickers. Are you aware there are ARDS mimickers? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. There's a list of causes of ARDS, right? Yes, sir. So ARDS uh, definition is based on PF ratio, mainly an exclusion of any cardiac cause, the short history, right? Yes, sir. So why to start why, with, unless and until if I want to uh, put a patient into the Berlin's criteria of ARDS definition, I need to have a PEEP or CPAP of at least five centimeter. Of yes, yes. So now the question to you is: certain conditions come under ARDS, and certain conditions are called ARDS mimickers. They are not in included in ARDS. ARDS mimickers I mentioned earlier: isnophilic, acute isnophilic pneumonia, acute ILD syndrome. Uh, hypersensitivity pneumonitis group, they are not included in ARDS. Huh? So, yes, is there a distinction here? Dr. Nitesh? Sir, there can be another thing, you know, there's something called a pseudo ARDS, which behaves something similar. It's a term. This is pseudo ARDS and ARDS mimickers, I think. Yeah. And uh, it refers to basically patients who have bilateral infiltrates, 
who seem to have ARDS. And uh, actually, in most of these patients, it is mainly because of atelectasis or certain, or certain amount of infusions, which can happen. So what really happens is most of our diagnosis is based on uh, PF ratios nowadays. And uh, because Berlin criteria was the one which was supposed to be, I mean, the last one, the last major criteria that has come up on the in the literature. And uh, still, it does not fulfill uh, the knee, uh, you know, no, no. Uh, that is, the we are not talking, compendium see, of patients. See, see, Dr. Nikolai, that is not, we are not talking about the Berlin definition. We always raise uh, questions about the Berlin definition. For example, if the PEEP is more than five, but the different ventilator settings, they'll have a different PF ratio. So all those fallacies are Correct. there. The question is, conditions like which I mentioned just now, ARDS mimickers, they are not included in your uh, ARDS causes, right? So, correct, correct. so this is a very fundamental question. The answer to this is the causes of ARDS on histopathology have a bad histopathology, diffuse alveolar damage, DAD. So it is on DAD. It's also referred to as DAD. Yes. So this is why these conditions which are clubbed together under the causes of ARDS are called ARDS etiology. And the others are called ARDS mimickers because they do not have diffuse alveolar damage on histopathology. So it is not a distinction made on clinical features. It is a distinction made on histopathology. And it's a loose kind of a distinction because there is an overlap sometimes. But that is just to make you understand because the ARDS mimickers are also very important. Right here in front of you, this patient could have been an ARDS mimicker who responded to 60 mg of methylprednisolone. We do not know. Uh, you have to be more invasive with your investigations, etc., to really diagnose these conditions. Not easy. Sometimes you even need to do a biopsy. Carry on, Dr. Okay, sir. So the next uh, point of discussion is, do I add steroid or wait at this point in time? We had already spoken about this. But if you uh, want to elaborate it further. No, I think uh, steroid. we discussed. So uh, please, uh, NIV, you want to say something about NIV? Slide on NIV. Yes, sir. NIV, uh, though it's not routinely recommended in the uh, patient of ARDS, it can be used in acute hypoxemic respiratory failure like acute exacerbation of COPD and acute pulmonary edema where it is its uh, use is well defined. Also, in some immunocompromised patients, we can use NIV. Okay. And uh, then the next okay. is how to prevent failure of NIV. The mild ARDS is one of those subsets wherein still that sort of a gray zone wherein you can go ahead and justify it. and there has been a significant amount of volume trauma that, that has been documented there has been significant uh, studies that have been done and that have actually documented a mortality scenario like uh, because of NIV increased chances of mortality yeah so NIV we already discussed when to use NIV the thing is Delayed intubation on failure of NIV is associated with the increased mortality. That is very important. Yes, sir. We have already discussed about the yes. role of intubation and the period. Yes, so that is very important. The patient should be monitored closely for one to two hours. If the respiratory rate, the saturation, the patient's comfort levels are not improving, it is very important to intubate. Now, the other thing about NIV is when you set NIV, what do you want to target? You want to target a saturation which is controlled by FI2 and your peak. What about pressure support? So pressure support, when you give, you're actually adding volume. And these patients are generally having a high volume. So you want to target a tidal volume of 6 to 8 ml per kg, even on NIV. And a mistake that is done is if the patient is not improving on NIV, we increase the pressure support. When we increase the pressure support, the tidal volume further increases. And high tidal volumes are injurious to the lung. So this is a mistake that we should not make. And it has been recommended by you know, experts that if you're getting a tidal volume of greater than eight to nine ml per kg after a couple of hours, that is failure of NIV. Because the lung injury that is occurring relates to the volume that is being delivered because that decides a transpulmonary pressure. So it's very important to target the tidal volumes along with the other parameters. So this is how you, you know, monitor the NIV. Very important not to just go on increasing the pressure support because that can be deleterious to the tidal volumes are large. And generally, patients with respiratory failure who come, you know, before that developed uh, fatigue and going into type 2 failure, 
they have uh, large respiratory drive and large uh, lung volumes, even to the tune of 10, 12 to 13 ml per kg. Normal tidal volume is 6 to 7 ml per kg. Okay, Kushbu, next slide. Sir, how to use my pulse oximetry more effectively in ARDS? This was also one of the point. Yeah, so go to the slide. So you carry on with the slides. Okay. So this yeah, was this skip, skip this. Skip. Berlin criteria, everybody knows. You can okay. skip this also. Um, what is this? This was criticism of Berlin's criteria, I believe. Yeah. So so what is, you know, you have said ability to predict mortality is still poor, but slightly better. So now the single most important factor in predicting mortality is severity of the ARDS. Severe ARDS has a higher mortality, 45%, followed by moderate around 35 and mild 30. So if you have to look at one factor, it is the classification. Severe ARDS is so the severity of ARDS is a single most important factor. Apart from that, earlier it was thought that pulmonary has a better outcome than pulmonary ARDS. But that has been abandoned. The ARDS uh, has been divided into two groups, hypoinflammatory and hyperinflammatory. So this hyperinflammatory and hypoinflammatory phenotypes of ARDS have four components. One is interleukin levels, then shock, then multi-organ failure, and severity of ARDS. And hyperinflammatory, which has all these worse features, the worse prognosis. So that is how you actually decide about the prognosis. If one thing was to be seen, it is just the severity of ARDS at admission. That is the single most important factor regarding prognosis. So next slide. She has also specified that low sensitivity when compared to autopsy findings. So that also deals with the issue of diffuse alveolar damage. Yes, yes. Carry on. Yeah, so steroids discussed. This we have discussed. Yeah, pulse oximetry. So what, so Kushbu, the pulse oximetry, we are not using, you know, as per the universal definitions, why are we not using pulse oximetry? What are the fallacies with pulse oximetry? So in ARDS per se, you are asking? Yes, yes, yes. No, the, you are right. You know, the people have recommended to use pulse oximetry also, you know, the, the ratio of the pulse oximetry to FR2. But uh, it is not uh, in vogue, you know, the recommendations are not there. We are using PO2 by FR2. So what are the problems with using pulse oximetry? Lack of standardization would be one. Absolutely. So that is, you know, so pulse oximeter, if there's hypotension, it will not pick up. A lot of these patients are in hypotension. If the patient has severe anemia, your saturation will not be picked up. The patient has a very high bilirubin, more than 10, it will not be picked up properly. If they're dark skinned, you will not get a saturation. But there's so many fallacies, it is not standardizable. So to standardize the thing and to get the correct picture, you use P5. Huh? So many of these patients are in hypotension. Hypotension, you know, you can uh, fallacious readings. Otherwise, also, there's a difference of plus minus 3% between your saturation on ABG and pulse oximetry. Pulse oximetry. That is why you use PF. It is not standardized. Carry on. NIV, sir, we've already seen. So there's an increased mortality once I just go back. So increased mortality with NIV, that is uh, what you have written. We have explained why there is increased mortality because when you put NIV, you are locked into a false sense of security and you keep the NIV on even if the PF is falling below 150, even if the patient is not improving. And this is delayed intubation. And when there's delayed intubation, there's uh, cytokine-mediated injury to the lungs, the lungs actually worsen, and that is why mortality is increased uh, on patients with NIV who fail NIV, not in all the patients. Patients who fail NIV, mortality is as compared to a control group. And the, th the next thing is about helmet. So what is the recommendation for the use of helmet? We have talked about high flow, we have used about, we have talked about cot, we have talked, we have talked about high uh, NIV. So the helmet, you know, the evidence is plus minus. You may or may not use it, it's either way. So recommendations cannot be made by international experts unless there is clear-cut evidence. And evidence has been controversial. You may or you may not use helmet. That is the statement about helmet use. Carry on. Then, then uh, this was regarding the uh, NIV failure, sir. There is a score called as HACOR score. Now, Karen, you can tell this. Please tell this. Uh, yes, sir. This includes the five parameters which are easily bedside, uh, can be monitored and includes the heart rate. A for acidosis, then uh, based on pH, 
C is conscious level, O, o is oxygenation, that is saturation, and the R is respiratory rate. The total score is of 25, and it's been uh, postulated that more than five score at the uh, beginning as well as at the end of 12 hours indicates the NIV failure. So in this case, if the score worsens uh, or it is, if at all it is more than five, the NIV failure should be considered and we should proceed with invasive ventilation. Okay, next slide. Khushbu, can you go back to the earlier one? Record score. Yes. Yeah, so now there's a 2022 paper that's come up now, which is called as updated record score, in which what they did was they included along with the other variables, the baseline data of pneumonia, cardiogenic pulmonary edema, pulmonary ARDS, immunosuppression, septic shock, and SOFA scores. And that was actually found to improve the predictive value of uh, do documenting NIV failure or predicting the NIV failure. Go okay. ahead. Go ahead, go ahead. How to predict success of HIV infected had already talked about yeah. Cox index. And how does the conscious awake proning work? So you can tell that. So how does it work? How conscious awake proning? So the patient, uh, the proning mechanism itself improves the oxygenation as the uh, anatomically, the lungs are uh, being conical with the apex lying on the ventral aspect. So once the patient is made prone, the oxygenation at the dorsal surface improves. So that improves the ventilation perfusion. Secondly, the complex. So if you are to prone yourself, will the oxygenation improve? Pardon, sir? If you were to prone yourself or any normal person, will the PO2 go up? Sir, uh, specifically in this patient, because the uh, dependent part are... No, no, more not this patient. This is a disease patient. I'm asking in general. If you prone any normal patient, will the PO2 go up? I have not checked it any okay. time. Okay, okay. So, PO2 can go up in a normal patient also because that is how the ventilation... Sir, perfusion basically, is. the ventilation perfusion ratio has been explained when we are doing a proning. So, the perfusion always favors the gravity. Wherever there the perfusion will increase the ventilation, the oxygenated will be definitely go better into the circulation. So, this is the reason why in a prone position, we get a better oxygenation, whether be it a normal patient or a disease patient. Absolutely. So, even in a normal patient, the, the oxygen does improve. So, what is the evidence, say, about uh, clinical outcomes with proning? Has it translated into decreased mortality rates or decreased intubation rates? Especially the ARDS? So, it is associated with decreased mortality when started early in the course of no, ARDS. No, no. So, Kushbu... The oxygenation does improve in certain patients, but it has not resulted in decreased intubation or mortality rates. That is what the evidence and the trials have finally concluded. It does improve oxygenation. So if you can do it comfortably, no harm. There should be no added, added risk or uncomfortableness to the patient, but it has not resulted in decreased mortality. Uh, these trials have been done after COVID. So that is the current consensus. It is not a magical thing. Conscious of it. Yeah, actually, improvement in oxygenation happens up to a point in time. But this improvement in oxygenation has not translated further into a mortality benefit or cure from ARDS at that point. In time. Absolutely. That is, the, that is the evidence. Carry on, Dr. Kushmi. So just go back to the slide. Don't jump. Just go back. Uh, rock index uh, we have discussed. Okay. Okay. Next. So, how does this we have discussed next? So, next. Uh, next. We already discussed this. Okay. So, paralytic agents also we have discussed next. Just go, go back to that slide, Kushbu. Young protective strategies. So here, you know, on the last slide, uh, we have this plateau pressure of less than 30, right? So this is uh, on, uh, how do you see the plateau pressure on volume control? Sir, in a fully paralyzed patient, we uh, pause, inspire, we give an inspiratory pause for 0.5 to 3 seconds. So at okay. the end of inspiration, the pressure monitor is pre flat. So how do you see it in PCB mode? Sir, it's already the, the, the platinum. No, what is the PC platinum pressure on a PCB mode? Is it the same as the inspiratory? Pressure, pressure inspiratory pressure. Sorry? The inspiratory pressure. 
Okay, so the peak inspiratory pressure is the same as plateau pressure. You plateau pressure. Okay, so can it be different? So if there is increased airway resistance, then maybe. No, you 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 have set a pressure control, right? Mm -hmm. So the pressure is already set. So it will it will not it will not, the pressure cannot rise beyond what you have set. So when can yes, the sir. be different from the peak inspiratory pressure? The plateau pressure can be different from the peak inspiratory pressure in pressure control mode. When does that happen? Plateau pressure more than it will not. It can never exceed the peak inspiratory pressure. It can be less. When is it less? And when do you put a pressure control in that sense? So, Dr. Masan, you want to answer that? Please repeat the question. The plateau pressure will be the peak, peak inspiratory pressure will be always less than the plateau pressure. No, no. In pressure control mode, the you set the pressure control right. The the plateau pressure is generally the same as peak inspiratory pressure. Right. Right. Now sometimes you can have a plateau pressure lower than the peak inspiratory pressure. Right. In pressure control, are you aware of this? When does this happen? No, I'm not aware of it. Okay. Uh, so this happens when your flow does not reach zero at end inspiration. Okay, there can be situations in which your flow is not reaching uh, zero at the end of inspiration. In these situations, your plateau pressure will be less than your peak inspiratory pressure because you have not delivered the entire volume. And here, the, we, when you put a pause, you will get a plateau pressure which will be less than your peak inspiratory pressure. Yes, Got it? Okay. And when it will be more? It can never be more. Your plateau be more, right, right. Cannot yes. be exceeding. The plateau pressure can never be more than the PIP. Yes. Yes. So in lung, uh, then we what more to start with? We have discussed this, I guess. Uh, this is plateau pressure, right? We have discussed, sir. We have discussed. This, okay. if you want to cover, you can cover. Sir, how can you... Uh... Carry on. Then how to use the values? Uh, it's a general... Uh, it's just a guide. If the P-plat is less than 30, we have, we have to start with the uh, calculating predicted body weight. Once the predicted body weight is calculated, we have to start with the tidal volume of 6 ml per kg. And uh, P-plat should be less than 30 centimeter of water. I think you can skip this. This is known to everybody. This is from the AIDS. Okay, so. Then this is about driving pressure. Yeah, so driving pressure. So would you like to tell now in driving pressure, uh, uh, what is the fundamental difference? Dr. Nicholas, you want to tell, you talk about driving pressure. What is the fundamental difference between driving pressure and plateau pressure? Basically, it's the difference between plateau pressure and peak, put simply. And uh, sometimes it is used, but again, no standardization. And it is sometimes uh, used in those patients who have moderate to severe ARDS, in whom we find that a low tidal volume strategy is not giving you the expected benefits. Yeah. Uh, so to understand the concept of driving pressure, one has to uh, understand that uh, in using plateau pressure, you use the ideal body weight and the total lung, right? The total lung is normalized to the ideal body weight and the volume is set as per the total lung volume. However, in driving pressure, you normalize it to the functional lung because the compliance comes into, if you look at the formula, compliance comes into the picture. So you are normalizing your volumes and your pressures to the baby functional lung. So that is the difference between uh, driving pressure and plateau pressure if you were to understand it conceptually. So everybody knows you know, the formula, that is all right. But to understand it at a physiology level, that is a difference. In plateau pressure, you use the volume of the normal lung, while in driving pressure, you use the uh, baby functional lung volume. That is the essential difference. Next. So this is the last slide. Yeah, so 
This is the last one. There was something about uh, peep also, high peep and low peep. The, that was before this. Next slide. You just show the, about high peep and low peep. Before. I'll never... Sir, I'll go back to three, yeah. four slides. Just... Next, before this. Before, before this. There was a how to high peep or something like that slide was there. Not I don't know. There. there was a slide on high peep and low peep. So, no, sir. Uh, uh, Kushbu, about high peep and low peep, what do you understand about high peep and low peep? Is there any high peep and low peep settings in the ventilator? Are there recommendations? No, sir. I don't have an idea. Dr. Masand, any, uh, any idea about high peep and low peep settings on the ventilator in ARDS? Sir, basically it is all uh, all about regarding whether the it is about as you said recruitable and non recruitable part. Mm -hmm. So we can go up to a maximum level till the patient is not requiring any kind of a vasopressor support, and we can add a wire press vasopressor support, and we can go even higher with that. Okay, so There's just one thing that I would add to that that would be that this is all and this is true that it is meant to have you know work on a recruitable lung and that is why you increase the peep however what really happens is in case if you are not seeing any benefit coming out of it you always start with a low peep and build up higher if in case you see you do not see any benefit coming out of it but um, then probably uh, using it uh, further is of no great uh, utility or application subsequently so uh, you have to see whether there are actually any improvement in parameters happening because of that. Yes. And there's no standardization regarding to the time intervals that we need to see in terms of a high peak. Yes. Now, what I was actually trying to say something uh, slightly different about that. Now, what are the recommendations and what are the values for high peak and low peak? So you see, there are no strict uh, numbers on what is exactly high peak and what is low peak. That is very clear. With different trials have used different uh, values of uh, PEEP at different FR2s, including the ARDS net. But grossly, you know, if at a value of uh, 0.6 FR2, you use a PEEP of 10, and at FR2 of 100, you're using a PEEP of 15, uh, this is low PEEP. Anything beyond that goes into high PEEP. Now, what are the recommendations? Should you use high PEEP or low PEEP? So this has been, uh, you know, on the basis of a meta-analysis of three trials, LOVE, ALVEOLI, and EXPRESS. These were the three trials which were done to assess uh, PEEP in uh, this thing, ARDS, and they use different combinations. So meta-analysis of this showed that high PEEP in moderate to severe ARDS reduced modality slightly as compared to low PEEP. So the recommendation is to use higher PEEP in moderate to severe ARDS and low PEEP in mild ARDS. Uh, this is uh, the evidence. These are the guidelines also in uh, surviving sepsis guidelines. So try to use a slightly higher strategy if possible. Of course, at the end of the day, you are guided by your P-plat or your driving pressure. But one should know this. Uh, it's very important to know high peep and low peep concept because for the exams also, this is very important for all those who are taking the exams. And uh, the other thing is, uh, we have come to the almost the end of the session. Uh, what is new in ARDS? So something which is new in ARDS is mechanical power. So this is the latest concept in uh, ARDS, the concept of mechanical power. That is, you ventilate not as per your P-plat, not as per your driving pressure, not as per your uh, putting in an esophageal catheter and measuring the transpulmonary pressure, but using mechanical power. So what is mechanical power? Now to understand mechanical power, every time the ventilator delivers some energy to the lungs, the lung is injured. You're delivering energy to the lungs whenever you deliver a positive breath. Till a certain amount of energy, this is okay. But if it goes beyond a certain level, it is going to injure the lungs. So a value of around 17 joules per second, this mechanical power has been seen to be safe in normal human lungs. But we do not know what level of mechanical power is safe in injured lungs. And work is being done on this. The idea is to deliver the lowest possible amount of mechanical power, right? And mechanical power uh, is coming out into the newer ventilators. Now, what formula for mechanical power? There's a formula also. 
mechanical power is actually the energy multiplied by respiratory rate and how do you get the energy energy is actually work so work is equal to delta p into delta v change in pressure into change in volume so what is the change in pressure so the change in pressure you get from motion right the motion of uh, the equation of motion gives you delta p and this multiplied by delta volume gives you the work done plus you added to the applied peep into delta volume because when you are giving peep then also some work is being done so this gives you the total amount of work being done and you multiply uh, sorry the pressure into the volume into the respiratory rate so i hope i was able to make some sense it is not so difficult so you can calculate it but the newer ventilators are giving mechanical power so this is the latest uh, concept because it integrates everything actually uh, sorry to interrupt uh, there is easier yeah, formula uh, also which is giving it yes yes kushbu i don't know if i'm correct or not but there is a easier for, for, uh, formula i remember it's a four into driving uh, pressure plus respiratory rate though much is not talked about our respiratory rate but the driving pressure certainly uh, that is a simplified one i guess for mechanical power so you have this formula basically it's an interview a prediction of lung injury yes i have not read about this formula you have told maybe we, you can if you can you can apply it and can see if it works out to be the same thing But the concept is what I told. You, you have to okay. multiply pressure into volume. That gives the work done. Work into respiratory rate is equal to the total amount of energy being delivered per. Uh, so maybe that works out to be the same thing. But that is how the formula is derived. And uh, the other thing new is the new ventilator has started giving it as as mechanical power. New ventilators are coming up, which will give mechanical power. So, but we still don't know the value uh, for the. Yeah, it, it, uh, yeah. So, so, you have to give the least amount of mechanical power, and work is being done. What is safe limit? Because ultimately, the nature of the lung also matters, right? Different lung, just like you do, do not have a single peak for different patients. It's very difficult to put a single value. Work is being done. This is research work. There is. Uh, yeah, no there is. There is a lot of work on standardizing this procedure. Yes. So, uh, to apply it differently in different patient subsets, it will take some time, I guess. Yes. So now the other thing is, I want to uh, tell about these stem cells. So this is another thing, latest thing published for intensive care medicine. Stem cells are being injected in the stage of ARDS to try and improve outcome. So this trial was done called the MUST stem trial, uh, and in this they injected stem cells. So they zeroed on into the lungs, and they act as anti-inflammatory. So they decrease the inflammation, and they found that in the intervention group, the outcome was much better than in the control group. So this is the other thing which is related to passed in ARDS, mechanical power and stem cells, just to bring you to the cutting edge of ARDS. And further work is being done on this. So I think those are the last things I wanted to say. Uh, Doctor Nikhil, anything you want to add? No, I guess it's a very exhaustive discussion. आज इतना ARDS discuss हुआ है उतना बहुत लंबे time में नहीं किया मैंने अभी थोड़ा समय Uh, doctor uh, uh, Masan, you want to say something? Nothing, sir. It was a complete discussion in itself. Uh, doctor Kushma, I mean, I can, I can probably think of adding ECMO only, but that would have taken it still more. That would have made it more exhaustive, and uh, I'm not sure. I mean, how much more can we grow? I mean, we can continue talking upon ARDS for hours together. It is such a huge subject. Each strategy becomes a big class. Doctor Kushbu, any questions? So just uh, to know the recent uh, uh, recommendations regarding use of ECMO in the patients in this ARDS patients. Are there any recent recommendations or recent studies regarding the same? No, the 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 criteria remain the same for using ECMO. There for that it is not there, but ECMO is very useful, and more and more evidence is being used. And now there are so much uh, uh, there's so much work being done on you know patients who are on ECMO. What kind of uh drug dosing what kind of uh, crt settings etc etc has been done that is what is the, the latest you know ecmo patients are becoming a different subset so ecmo is very much there there is nothing new now this question is there how to optimize high flow nasal cannula when to increase flow and how to decrease so you like to answer that dr niklesh uh can i see the question sir just a minute i'll go yeah. to the chat how to optimize hfnc 
uh, will you look at your oxygen saturations and monitor it initially by the abgs and uh, you can decide on how you want to uh, basically increasing flow and decreasing flow is dependent on your oxygen saturations and abgs most of the times they are the monitoring tools that you should look at that is all i mean there's not there's no major rocket science to it if your patient is not saturating well you keep on going up on the uh, flows and the fio2s and do remember that uh, if your patient is requiring more than 30 liters flow then this patient is satisfying the criteria for uh, moderate to severe ards and that's when you should start thinking about you know actually uh, that your hfnc is probably not working fine enough and then they these patients would require invasive ventilation yeah so to, to set uh, the high flow nasal cannula actually you know uh, you have to adjust the flow the flow uh, is anything like 30 to 45 initially because 60 so some people tolerate so the flow you try to optimize the flow as per the comfort levels of the patient and then if i to set to target the uh, your uh, saturation so that is how you go about it and when you want to wean it uh, there is no standardized protocol you come down on the fir2 and the flow so that is about uh, setting the high flow nasal cannula so are there any more questions So there are no questions now. Uh, uh, to thank uh, every, thank thanks everybody. So for contributing to this, Dr. Kushbu, thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you very, thank very much. much, Dr. Nikleshar. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. We enjoyed our time. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, sir. So.